right, ladies and gentlemen, this afternoon we have Samantha LaDuc, who is the founder of LaDucTrading.com and CIO at LaDuc Capital LLC. She is known for timing major market inflection points in equities, commodities, bonds and rates, currencies, and especially volatility. As a macro to micro analyst, educator, and trader, Ms. LaDuc makes her insights available to active traders and investors who want to minimize risk while seizing year-making opportunities. Samantha, we're so happy to have you this afternoon. The floor is yours. Thank you so much and welcome everyone. Thanks for uh, attending. I am the founder of LaDukeTrading.com and Laduke Capital LLC. I make a business of market timing. And to me, market timing is volatility timing. It very much impacts the direction uh, where I take my trades and my analysis for clients who follow. I support active traders and investors from beginner, intermediate to advanced. And this is my website, LaDukeTrading.com, if you want to find out more. I do approach it a little bit differently um, in that I have very much used macro as a backdrop with micro. Um, and that's using this backdrop of economics as well as a whole bunch of you know, intermarket analysis and quant and fundamental and technical and sentiment. But the point is, I'm converging a whole bunch of silos of information and putting them together and collect, connecting basically the uh, story or the narrative of where I think the market is going to go next. And then obviously share those predictions with clients and that's how we make our money. So this is very much discretionary trading. It's what I do every day in my live trading room for clients um, across my client Slack workspace, all of my analysis and research, trade setups, the whole thing, as well as my risk-defined options, uh, option trades. This is not just a place where uh, clients can get my analysis, which is very much focused, again, on market timing calls across all asset classes and timeframes, but I also have a trading desk of eight. So I have a hedge fund manager. I have um, a specialist in just oil and gas. I have commodities traders, full-time, uh, momentum traders, short duration, chase traders, um, longer term trend traders. I have very much a focus on uh, gamma, which is very much based on um, the, the quant of volatility. But the point is, it's really, we cover it all. I've got a futures trader. So we're basically coming together and mentoring um, clients who want to learn, as well as those are, who are already quite sophisticated in this business of actively trading and investing, including uh, professional institutions. So my backdrop is first finding durable trends at inflection points, and then drilling down into that kind of deliverable, actionable trade idea and setup so that I can help um, clients manage those trades for themselves. And this is across multiple products, Leduc Trading Fishing Club. I have an institutional edge product. I have a Discord product. So this is all where it basically comes together and I submit the analysis as well as the, uh, uh, the trades. So this is really my thing. I love to do this. I love to anticipate where the market is going to go. And right now it's very difficult because the Fed, as we all know, the FOMC is tomorrow. So trying to identify what the rates market is doing with the equities market, with uh, positioning, with um, technical levels of overbought and oversold, all of that good stuff. And then I apply my intermarket or secret sauce to it. And luckily this has been able um, to help time some really really key inflection points. So just a, a quick look backwards, which is basically I'm really into this market timing. This is this is my my focus. And the topic of this particular um, you know episode, if you will, of this talk, to me seemed much more timely to discuss the market structure because where we have come from the beginning of the year, where we had all kinds of, you know, how big houses and big funds, um, uber bullish. I was very much, very much in the minority. In fact, I did a stock charts TV interview with a whole bunch of really, really um, brilliant folks, uh, Tony Dwyer, Rick Benzinger, 
uh, Mary Ellen McGonigal, Craig Johnson from Piper. And basically, I set up my entire thesis, which was that NASDAQ would underperform. It literally was my key going into January that we would have a growth to value rotation. It was a key, key, key theme. And I wrote a big article about it for clients, made it available um, publicly as well, which was basically that this theme of things over paper, inflation is sticky, oil as an inflation hedge would pick up and NASDAQ outperformance for 13 years would end. As much as I was excited about trading NASDAQ and the, the spy from you know COVID on up, it had an, an expiration point, in my opinion, of just getting exhausted. So I wanted to share kind of the process of how I came up with this as a process to time the volatility for this drawdown in stocks that we obviously have had, but also in bonds. So this was not just my only theme that we were going to top in equities, and I gave all my reasons for it, okay? And I came all the way down here, and I came basically, and I said, you know what? Summary, this was January, beginning of January. The synchronization of buying every dip the past two years has been stunning. I contend at some point this year, the buyers will step away and let gravity take hold, given that about one third of the investors are new and margin buying has seemed to peak and start to roll over. I contend that 2020 will be set for a stage of problems that are new that will test our new traders and our old 40 year long macro frameworks. The Fed put has moved and since 2013 taper tantrum, I would wager it sits about 20% below current market prices. At the time I wrote this, the market was 4,800. My price target for the pullback was 3,800. We overshot that. We hit 3670-ish, uh, no, actually 3636 before we have had a sizable um, kind of range since then um, up to 4,000. So we've basically been chopping about for the past few months um, in this kind of very, very tight range between 3,800 and 4,000. But the point is, this was my baseline bet going into the year that NASDAQ would underperform, we would drop 20%. NASDAQ dropped 35%. So I was off a little bit on that, but SPY did deliver a nice, beautiful 22% pullback. Basically, this was all based on volatility timing. So my whole baseline bet was an accommodative Fed reduces volatility, a tightening Fed by definition triggers it. So with that, value should lose less than growth at the very least, if not straight out outperform. All right, so that's the prediction that got me into this kind of piece and why I have been very, very adamant about this um, rotation from growth to value, big picture. Now, under the surface, I'm going to show you some charts that kind of time the swings, the, the shorter duration moves between growth to value and value to growth, because that's all about volatility when it enters a particular sector or market or stock. So now let's go to where we are right now. Okay, so that was my baseline bet. And by the way, also for bonds. Bonds, bonds, bonds. I was a big bond bear. And I actually had set up a chart, and I'll show you that in just a minute, of the, uh, the, the bond crash. I had basically identified that back in October of 2021 and did a, a whole series of my the thesis from August 2020 all the way to October 21 that basically said bonds are not done going down. In fact, I see a crash. And we did. So that's market timing. That is timing volatility. Capitulation or crash, where are we now? Now that we've pulled back in the first half of the year, literally it's the second worst start for the S&P ever, trailing only 1932. But it was it has been the worst start of the year ever for bonds and NASDAQ, which of course are bond proxies. So this is all because of inflation, higher oil, not to mention the very um, sudden and sharp uh, rate of change in interest rates, okay, the Fed hiking regime. So current inflation measures are absolutely wreaking havoc on a global stage, right? Countries are raising interest rates as stagflation fears take hold. So stagflation fears are that which is, we got lots of money chasing too few goods, okay? This is basically a overheated economy. Fed wants to slow it down a little bit. It's got a lot of work to do. And it's sending out a whole bunch of mixed messages right up in today when it says it's not going to send out any messages anymore. It's not even going to give you guidance. 
anyway, let's get back to what you probably didn't know was that you might not have been able to time this top and you wouldn't have been alone. Goldman Sachs started the year with a prediction of 4% growth in 2020 and four rate hikes. Now they predict 14 rate hikes and a recession. Consider the flagship Fidelity Contra Fund with over 100 billion in assets under management. It's down twice as much as the S&P in the past year, negative 22% versus 10.6% and a whopping 28% as of June, I should say 30th. Anyway, the catch up game is tough, right? So market timing is volatility timing and the catch up game for large funds, houses, your portfolio, et cetera, is a tough game. Okay, so calling a major top, my process, what did I use? Like, how, how did I get into this? I mean, you can see I wrote an article about it. I did a presentation about it. And obviously I'm looking at the markets every single day with clients. This was one chart that I thought was very, very helpful to kind of explain. This is Compaq and SPX, X, SPX. It's a ratio chart. And hopefully you can see this. Over here is 2000. This is on a monthly, by the way. So it shows you back to 1990s, okay, all the way here. This is 2009. Again, this is tech relative to the S&P. This is a ratio chart that I use. This is obviously big picture. You can bring it down to a smaller time frame. But the point is, I saw this head and shoulders formation, which is a technical pattern. I love technical analysis. And it looked very, very dangerous for lower, right? So this is part of the process of market timing and timing volatility. Where are we today? Right here. We've come down to the bottom of this trend line and we've had a little bounce. Not much of a bounce, a little one. And now folks are asking the question, is this capitulation or is this a crash waiting to happen? We've already come down considerably. I'll talk about my views for what's next a little bit later. But this is one of the ways that I am constantly comparing to compare and contrast, compare and contrast and correlated assets, uncorrelated assets. I'm doing a lot of intermarket analysis. In bonds, I had actually literally posted this chart. Check this out. I, read, I wrote an article that deflation ended, deflation of wages ended with COVID. Posted this for clients October 13th, 2021. Okay. And my whole theme, again, this was growth to value rotation. Um, everything inflationary that was in play earlier in the year is still in play. Productivity, pay gap, playing catch up, bonds are stocks without circuit breakers. And my whole point was that bonds were going to crash even more, even though everyone was, again, very bullish bonds after a protracted downtrend since summer of 2020. So I wrote this article and the very last thing I wrote and chart that I showed, okay, was the 30-year U.S. Treasury bond price for many, many decades from the 40s. You can see that interest rates have gone down and bonds have gone up in this very, very defined pattern for a long time. I was of the opinion that we had another head and shoulders pattern and that was going to break. So my last sentence or paragraph on this was this chart of the 30-year treasury bond shows price has stayed in an ascending channel the past 40 years. It's forming a trend reversal pattern known as a head and shoulders. Once this channel breaks, we will know inflation is more than transitory or sticky. It will be clear inflation is systemic because bonds will begin their descent. At that point, the rate of change in the bond breaks will matter to volatility and to market returns. Bonds, after all, are just equities without circuit breakers. The market tell will be when bonds sell off with stocks, which they have, in the midst of rising energy and commodity prices, oh my, did they, this could be very destabilizing to markets and econo economies worldwide as the risk parity trade is unwound in favor of cash. What happened to risk parity trade? Biggest, biggest downdraft in history. That's the 60-40 stock bond portfolio balancing that crashed and why funds are so underwater. Um, and what has been the best performing asset in 2020? Cash. All right, so that's market timing is volatility timing. So getting back to this, that was before. What does that 30-year treasury bond price look like now? Here we are down here. Can you see how it broke the channel? So I contend it's not even done. All right, we could have a bounce. 
but it's not done. Okay, moving on, macro matters. So for those who are just trading technically, some of this might be very interesting to you. Pull out in time, use a monthly, use a weekly, not just you know intraday charts or day. It really can give you a flavor, a much, much better look at things. Uh, perspective accounts, but so does macro. So inflation ran really hot with Fed, who was clearly in denial for better part of a year. And it wasn't until November, 2021 that the Fed removed the word transient from its vocabulary in regards to inflation. And that is when oil, not to mention other commodities and cyclical plays tried to hard ass, tied to hard assets really started to move higher with crude oil doubling into March, 2022, as I predicted. So I had another article for clients back in March of 2021, where I said crude is oil, as long as it stayed above 65 on the monthly, it was gonna go to 130 within a year by March, 2022, and it has. Now, since March, it has digested widely, but it's still digested sideways and has not crashed down despite many, many efforts by um, the White House to you know, release reserves from the Strategic Petroleum Reserves or to tap it down through all kinds of other means. The point is, it's still bid, it's still sticky. So if investors now that we've had this sticky inflation and a CPI print of 9.1 last month, which was my baseline bet. If investors start to really question the Fed's ability or desire to control inflation, then we're really going to see volatility. Okay. The long end, which is that 30 year, the 10 year, the 20 year, will really come undone and rates would move materially higher. Obviously, they don't want that. That would be, you know, crushing to debt holders, whether it be sovereign, corporate, or personal. So far, until today, at least, when they just I have intonated they're going to remove guidance. So you can follow me on Twitter for a, a thread on that. The problem to this narrative catching on is that most analysts and economists see inflation moving materially lower over the next 12 to 18 months, and they're already pricing in cuts rather than structurally higher. So this is not my baseline bet. I believe we're going to have rolling peaks of inflation and very much rolling bottom uh, forming in equities, rolling bottoms in equities. So these are my investment themes. They've been pretty sticky. Um, things over paper since July, 2020. Oil as an inflation hedge since November, 2020. And inflation equals sticky, especially wages. Again, my article, Deflation Ended with COVID. And it means it's talking about wages. This is wage right here. The Atlanta Fed wage growth tracker overall. Look at that puppy. I mean, that's what Fed fears most. That is just the enemy of bonds. So this is harder. It's, a, it's lagging. Once it plays catch up, though, it's very, very slow to retrace, okay? So the macro trades that I've recommended for clients that are, again, because of this new regime with the Fed, is that we would have higher yields from higher CPI. And take a look at this chart. This is a, a great one by Charlie Bellello, which is, here's CPI. This was last month, even before the, the 9.1. But the point is, we have Fed funds rate way down here. There's a huge divergence of catch up, okay? So they're trying very much to get control of inflation or I should say the narrative of inflation, but uh, it, it's very, very much structural in my view. Higher oil, it comes from higher yields. We also have a supply deficit, but the major emphasis is on higher yields and higher dollar from um, emerging market panic, as well as just the old, good old fashioned equity bond de-risking, what happens when folks sell, institutions and individuals sell their equities or their bonds, they go to cash. Bitcoin is not, has not been a hedge. Bonds have not been a hedge. Gold, precious metals have not been a hedge. Oil right now is in a sideways chop. So this is something that I warn very much about that I don't think that this structural move higher in yields is done. That will be producing more volatility, not less as we kind of move on. This is a five-year U.S. Treasury yield index. Um, down here, it's called a rate of change indicator. And I warned clients when this was extremely oversold and it percolated higher in the summer of 2020, finally triggered, and then really got going in 2021, that this actually is a momentum thrust. It indicates this can last for years. This is not a one and done. This means Inflation can stay sticky with yields. This is the dollar. The dollar is basically showing the 2000 top right here and how since again, summer 
of really uh, 2021, not 20, but I would say it broke out higher in a year ago. We have not only pushed higher, but we have higher that we can go still. This is an indicator that I use. It's more cyclical. Anyway, the point is I have had a bet for higher dollars since last summer and higher yields for two years, and they're still in play. So that by nature is also volatility or a headwind for markets. Oil, again, this was back in, in October. I warned, looks like we're going to go and hit that 130. This comes from a presentation that I actually did. And also it's been on baseline bet for over a year and a half. But the, the point is we are up here and we're digesting all over the place, but we have not, we have not succumbed to rolling over strongly in oil. This is CRB, which is an index that basically shows mostly oil, but some other commodities. And we've been in a long, this is on a daily. So you can see from November, you know, we definitely came back, but we're still staying in trend staying in trend. So oil to me is digesting and holding on to this channel for support and still looks bullish. Okay, about VIX. These are some geeky tells for some that you're going to wax over it, but for others, they're going to be like, what the heck is that? This is an indicator that I use that helps me time whether we're going to have a garden variety pullback or a crash. So this is backwardation from what we are currently in, which is contango. And it is a ratio analysis that I use. I also can do this technically. I love using VIX technically. I have no problem with that. And right now we've been shopping about in a channel, but notice how the channel stopped going down in the summer of 2021. And now we're making higher highs. So one of these, one of these days, I can see an absolute reason for this to spike higher. In the meantime, we're just kind of shopping about but rising in that channel. I also compare stock bond, uh, I have a ratio with volatility that helps me identify when the market on a shorter duration, this is daily, helps me to time whether the market is bullish or bearish. And right now it has been intonating higher, but it hasn't spiked higher. So long story short, we use this on a tighter time frame. Something I also use is cumulative volume a lot. I put it side by side for clients, week, day, hour, and July 15th, the market was saved. I could tell. I could do it real time in my trading room because they came in and they bought massive amount, excuse me, massive amounts as we were just about ready to roll over into an air pocket of risk. It was fascinating. And I had warned clients that if we broke, this happens to be the 100 week, we bounced exactly off of it, that we were going to be crashing. Right now, we're currently having capitulation. For how long? I don't know. Right now, we're right up to about this level. We haven't even made it halfway through this channel. Point is, there are lots of vehicles. It's your, in, your ability to kind of interpret it and make it your own. These are the ones that I have built for my geeky intermarket tell on volatility. But there are others. NICE, which is a New York Stock Exchange. I can do this technically, and I can see that, oh my, we started to roll over beginning of the year, and we are bouncing right now, itty bitty but we're still in a downtrend. So much of this under the surface is still in a protracted downtrend. This is an advanced decline, cumulative for NICE. And we literally went up the mountain, plateaued, and now we are going down the mountain. We have these short covering rallies like we did in March, like we had, a, this was the March. Um, but the point is they're still not very exciting. It's still short the rip, not by the dip. NASDAQ advanced decline. This one is really worth taking a look at. NASDAQ 100 advanced decline, another intermarket tell to help me with, with volatility. You can see where this has gone straight up since 2009, especially 2013. This is really protracted. Okay, this is on a quarterly basis. This is true. But now zoom in a little bit. Here we are. First time it's been digesting. This is the November top in NASDAQ. We just popped above it. That's bullish. Below is bearish. So there are ways to time the market, which can also help with volatility. Speaking of which, this is a curious little drama. We've got Apple reporting in two nights. Curiously aligns, by the way, stock price with QE, where they have been doing massive amounts of buybacks. In fact, Apple has bought back 500 billion in stock over the past 10 years. That's greater than the market cap of 493 companies in the S&P. And it timed 
perfectly with the Fed's massive QE in 2013. So in the same way that this has been hot fire flames, especially since 2013, look at this parabolic rise in NASDAQ 100. Apple has been buying back stock hand over fist. That helps. All right, speaking of tech, growth over to value rotation is a really big part of my uh, client deliverables. So I am doing this on a tight time frame, which is obviously many years when I'm timing when growth is going to rotate into value. Okay. And in lieu of sector rotation, volatility reprices everything. So rotation between sectors as a factor really matters. But you can also do this on a daily. So I will annotate for clients. Okay, this is growth. We're outperforming. Now value's outperforming. Oh, little blip here in the March end of quarter rally. That's growth. Oh, now we're back to value outperforming growth. And now we're in an end. Right now, we're in a growth blip right? Since June, sort of, kind of, we're up, you know, 8%, not a big deal. But the point is, we have definitely had outperformance of growth over value recently until this trend line. So market timing equals volatility timing in my bit. And so does the Fed. Man, that matters to volatility. We've got yield curve inversion. And you've heard about this, hopefully. It's a big deal. And you, you can be afraid, but I'm not. I am more afraid when Oh, when it steepens. So when it comes out of yield curve inversion and moves higher, that's when recession triggers. That's when recession triggers. We're just inverted. So we've got a little bit of time before we actually can trigger a recession. And obviously it's in hindsight most of the time. Anyway, this signal has preceded seven of the past eight recessions since the 1970s. Talk about volatility. So the Fed matters. Housing matters. Check out this extremely large divergence between house price index and owner's equivalent rent of residences. This is a 61% spread, bigger than 2007, 2008. And why does this matter? When housing rolls over, it takes GDP, economic growth, and jobs with it. It's a big deal. We haven't rolled over yet, but when we do, it'll also trigger a recession. So unemployment. I do this. I know. I, I chart everything. Um, steep declines in unemployment rate typically max out in late cycle pre-recession as the economy overheats and employers have difficulty hiring. You heard that, right? I mean, oh my goodness, the jolts, which is the job openings, have two to one openings for every you know person unemployed. The point is that bottomed in March, I and mean, that topped in March at the same time that unemployment claims bottomed in March. At the same time, can you see what's happening with markets? So the market's already smelled this. Market has R isn't waiting. And here's the last chart I kind of want to go over before I stop. Top uh, markets right here. If I put this S&P on a yearly, I know most people don't do that, but I want to show a technical pattern. It's called a bearish engulfing. It engulfs the prior year's price action from top to bottom. This can bounce, by the way. There's no question by the end of this year. But next year, it's very much foreboding lower levels. So I don't think we're going to get above 39.94 on a quarterly close. We could tag even 4,200, but I don't see all-time highs again this year. And in fact, I see this rolling over. We're overshooting 3,400 on our way to 26, 2,700 next year. So I definitely believe that this is coming. Um, that's volatility. Again, most people don't trade on a yearly or a quarterly chart. So I just point that out because it matters. It's still the backdrop. You're, you're working with a tailwind or a headwind. And this chart says if you're bullish for a capitulatory low to take out all-time highs, that would be panic. In other words, that would actually be a big short the rip opportunity. Final thoughts, inflation staying sticky across the board. And that's not even including recession fears growing with much weaker economic data from consumer spending to manufacturing, stagflation as baseline bet, um, geopolitical risk. I have, of course, not even highlighted Russia, China, Taiwan, et cetera, because we have so many of our own factors that we can actually quantify, supply chain disruptions, right? Right now, my baseline bet for volatility is that we will have inflation peaks that roll. Fed will hike aggressively, pause, have, hike aggressively, pause, We'll have deflationary and inflationary spikes in commodities. Paper markets very different than physical. That will form rolling equity bottoms 
and much more volatility for the next few years, not just months. So hopefully that is it. I had my half hour. Um, take care. And as far as questions, yes, you'll have this recording so you can get all of these charts and you'll hear my voice. And <laughs> okay, uh, last but not least, yes, I have um, a website. Just go check it out and you'll see I've got Discord, which is the newer traders. I've got institutional traders. And then, of course, Fishing Club and Macro Advisor Bundle. This is very much for the intermediary and want uh, intermediate traders who want um, access to my research as well as um, all of my contributors and prices are on my website. You can reach out and get more questions there. Also, feel free to follow me on Twitter. I have um, at Samantha LaDuke, right? So definitely if you're looking for more of the macro feel, that's what I uh, talk about in more detail. Obviously, I've got a lot more detail for clients, but you can follow me here. Check me out there and get this presentation when um, Money Show uploads it. I thank you so much for your time. Did I hopefully in time? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Samantha. And we are over time. So thank you again. And we've got more content coming up.